Um, yeah, welcome back. Um, I know all the cool guys are talking about C++ 17, maybe already 20. Um, I'm trying to tell you a little bit about my one of my top three C++ 11 um, features. Um, I think it's, um, well, maybe not important, but it's uh, very interesting. So despite C++ 17, let's see what C++ 11 can, 11, sorry, C++ 11 can do for us. Um, Agenda is, of course, if I'm talking about the range-based for loop, I will introduce it to you. I want to talk about ranges because, after all, it's the range-based for loop. And I want to present some limitations, what I think can be limitations of the range-based for loop. Um, then I want to introduce you to Boost Range, which is a library which allows to um, overcome, I guess, most of these limitations. Um, and afterwards, um, Boost doesn't have a solution for every problem. I want to show you how you can uh, create your own um, range adapter for yeah, some more exotic problems. Um, one thing, if you got a question, um, just ask away. And it's, uh, you might know it's really hard to tell what the level of C++ is in the audience. I try to make it very, um, very detailed. Uh, of course, I can't ask you to to shout at me that it's too boring but yeah maybe maybe i'll try to to get feedback from you if we if we want to do it in that much detail okay so let's start and uh, the regular loop i guess you all know it in all its glory using iterators as we did in c plus plus 98 and 03 um i guess nothing more to say here I think there's some problems with the regular for loop. Um, one of it is there's a lot of boilerplate code. Um, we're all lazy programmers, right? We don't want to write a lot of boilerplate code, which is mostly the same. Um, it's not so easy to detect how the container is traver traversed. Imagine that um, you got legacy code and uh, this small loop body is actually a big, big raw loop. It's really hard to tell what this loop is doing exactly you need to have a very very close look so for example does the loop start with the first element of the range does it end with the last element is the iterator maybe manipulated are we visiting some elements twice are we skipping some elements you can't really know from from one glance maybe maybe begin end okay that's fairly easy but if something is happening in here with the iterator you don't know you need to look um yeah just told you that um, and there's some potential pitfalls not too too big but still um the iter iterator increment usually you would use a prefix um, increment to avoid um, an unnecessary copy um, and then also the the comparison the the end condition okay i don't see the laser sorry but the end condition uh, you could use uh, less for example then you change the container type and then suddenly it doesn't compile anymore because your iterator doesn't support it stuff like that so maybe not the best thing and with uh, integer with index based loops um, you have similar problems if not more then you get index problems off by one stuff like that but yeah c plus plus 11 we get the range based for loop um it solves uh, most of the problems it's uh, way shorter, as you can see. So all the boilerplate's gone away. Um, ah, yeah, the the range-based for loop is equivalent to the to the loop I just showed you, but with these um, advantages, advantages, no uh, boilerplate code, um, fast to write, easy to understand what's going on. With this, you know that uh, the whole container is traversed. Um, you know that the iterator can't be manipulated because you don't have access to the um, to the iterator, and you also know that uh, the iteration happens exactly in the order the the container or the range um, defines. Um, in my opinion, that's um, that's the biggest advantage of the range-based for loop. You get this guarantee: it's visited every element is ex visited exactly once in the order defined by the container. Um, so there's less pitfalls. Um, the only one I really could think about was how to do this, how to do the capturing. Now, this will be the first part where I want, where I need your feedback. Um, do you really need me to talk about by value, by reference, R value, L value? I guess you know that, right? So let's skip it and gain a little bit of time. Well, um. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. Is, is this your canonical way? Do you say always write author ref ref? No. Actually, I would not say that. I, it's, I mean, it's the... I would say it's the canonical way which you can use without much thinking, so to say. But personally, I don't do it like this, and I wouldn't recommend uh, doing it like this. I would, um, yeah, like it's the same li as with, uh, with with function arguments, right? And I would do the same argument here, like if it's when it's integers, don't use a reference. So this, but for the example, I had to choose one, and I chose the most generic. Well, I would argue about const. Const makes a difference, and you have transform-like loops and loops that modify them. Uh, yeah, so that's more or less this, maybe, by const reference and non-const reference, and yeah, the Question forwarding reference. Pages, uh, does the compiler really, like, uh, does it make a difference if I use it, uh, a const reference, uh, if it's an integer or not? Because in the end, the compiler will uh, know that it's const, and then what, if it's reference or just an integer anyway? <coughs> So um, I need to repeat your question anyway, so I'm trying to, to rephrase it, or, or if I understood it correctly. So if the range contained integers, and I would use const ref, for example, if the compiler would uh, convert it to const without ref? Uh, no, uh, you said it's faster if uh, you take it by value, because <coughs> integer is shorter than the, the reference. I didn't say it, but yeah. That, <laughs> <laughs> that was your logic. Was yeah. the compiler know that it's an integer? And does, does the compiler do that or not? That was my question. Okay, now we get into the depths of the standard. <laughs> I'm not really the standard expert. I would think that there's, yeah, I don't, that's, I don't think that the standard uh, mandates that. Maybe your, ca um, your compiler will optimize it, but there's no guarantee. That's what I would think. And I get some nods. Daniel? I expect the compiler to, to inline that. But it's, it's an that's how complex your code is. I mean, it's, it's another boundary for the optimizer, but the optimizer is certainly able to... Do something like that. So to remove a const if it's... Uh, to, to remove the reference. And, uh, uh, and the reference, of course, yeah, to remove the reference. Okay, so um, does this fit the... Should we talk about it, uh, about the const, non-const? I see not, so maybe we skip it, okay? If we have two, two complaints? Uh, we skipped it, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, as I said before, range-based for loop, not container-based for loop. Um, what is a range? And I'm talking, hopefully, uh, if I'm wrong, you correct me. I'm talking of uh, terms of the C++11 standard. Um, because maybe you heard about the ranges TS, and that's going to change things, but this is a C++11 talk, so C++11 standard. Um, so range is a sequence of items denoted by an iterator to the first item, and an iterator past the last item, the end iterator. I, I assume you are familiar with that concept. Um, to use an iterator with, um, with the range-based uh, for loop, it needs to fulfill three, um, three properties. One is that it's uh, incrementable. One is that you can compare for inequality, because you need to compare for inequality with the end, uh, end iterator. And of course, you need to de be able to dereference it, otherwise it would not really make sense. Um, and of course, the, the range-based for, uh, for loop needs uh, means to receive this begin and pass the end iterator. So that's um, the last part of what the range defines. There need to be, um, yeah, this means. There's three different uh, possibilities. and. Um, the compiler will take the first possibility in the list that follows. So first possibility is that your range expression is um, C array, an array type. In that case, it will um, use um, the, the pointer to the first element of the, of the array as the begin iterator, and will add the size to that pointer as the end iterator. Um, it's not, um, I guess it's not mandated by, mandated by the standard, but usually, as far as I've seen, that's done by std begin, std end, which has an overload for array types. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I guess that's... 14, um, you're right, uh, that's a 14 edition. Interesting, because I'm using it, and I compiled it with uh, Clang and GCC with the C++11 option, <coughs> and it did not complain. 
but yeah, <laughs> weird, okay. <coughs> so second option, because very rarely that we use um, arrays, is that you have a class type and that uh, class has an, a begin and an end member. In this case, um, the, um, this, this um, case is used and it does not matter which type the begin and end members have or the accessi accessibility. So if you have, a, you pass as a range expression, a class instance, which for example has an embedded enum and the enum has a begin equals one and end equals two, it will use this class and see it as a, as a range because it has a begin and end member. Afterwards, of course, it will fail to compile because you can't um, invoke um, your enum items. But uh, in the first glance, it will, it will use l this even if there's maybe a free begin end function for your class. But that's not checked yet. It has found your begin end members and they will be used. Um, while preparing the, the, this talk, I, I wouldn't have uh, thought of it, but I found out that your begin end members can even be function pointers or std functions. It need not be um, uh, member functions. Sounds a bit crazy, but uh, yeah. <laughs> As long as it can be invoked, it works. And yeah, lastly, um, if you have a um, free begin and end function in the same namespace as um, the range expression, same namespace is basically so that, um, ah, now I understand you other guys. Um, uh, yeah, great. Interesting control. Um, so there's ADL, argument dependent lookup, this might be a more complex topic. It is a more complex topic, but basically it boils down to that um, a function, what is going on with this? That a function um, can be found, although it's not being used, or its, um, its um, namespace is, is not being used, um, due to the type of the argument. So a popular example is if you use stutzy out, less, less, and then some, some string, for example, this less less is an operator less less, of course, but this operator lives in the std namespace. So in theory, you, you should not be able to use it if you're not uh, doing a using namespace std. But thanks to this argument dependent lookup, it still gets picked up because you pass std c out to it. So it's also looking in the std namespace for this operator less less. Bit complicated, but um, that's basically if you have a begin and end free function in the same namespace as what you're passing, then uh, they get picked and that's um, the third option. But remember, if your class has um, the begin and members, your begin and free functions won't be looked at. It will stop at the second stage. And there's uh, one thing, brace init list, um, great joy for all of us. Um, there's one talk or maybe several talks with, uh, with uh, I forgot his first name, with Myers, uh, Scott, not Steve, Scott Myers. Mm -hmm who like repeats three times braced in its list do not have a type or have no type. He says have no typing uh, even. But in context of an auto deduction, and that's the case in the range based for loop, they get deduced as a standard initializer list. Standard initializer list has a begin and end member. So um, a brace, uh, braced init list like this can be used directly in a um, range based for loop. Um, example for the third, ca for the third case, um, how many of you are familiar with boost file system and, and the directory iterator? Okay, some of you. Basically, it's an, it's an iterator which um, serves to iterate all the files in a given directory. There's also a recursive iterator which does what you expect it to do. Um, conventionally, you would use it like this. So um, you pass... Um, you construct um, this iterator with the parent directory as the begin iterator. You use the default constructor as the end iterator. And then you increment um, the iterator, of course. And this will print the path, the absolute path, to all the files in this directory. Now the boost guys were smart enough um, to add free functions, free begin and end functions in the same namespace, boost file system. <coughs> so there's a boost file system begin function which um, takes a an, an directory iterator by reference and returns this same reference. And there's also a boost file system end function, which always returns a default constructed um, iterator. So it will always be the end iterator automatically. This means that you can rewrite this regular loop with this um, range-based for loop, which in my opinion looks way nicer, way cleaner, 
and yeah, the, the typical guarantees, you can't fill around with the iterator. It iterates the directory once and only once, so that's really nice. So all you need to do is use the, director, uh, the directory iterator here directly. The range-based for loop will find the begin and end functions. Um, this iterator is preserved as the begin iterator. The end function returns you the default constructed iterator, and you got your range. Really, really nice. And easy to, yeah. Isn't that kind of a main stash? Because you expect ranges on the right side here, and not iterators. <laughs> um, do, they have a, do they have a type alias? Directory range? Or something like that? No, because this is, so we expect ranges, that's right. And this, uh, the directory iterator is an iterator, but as I told you before, uh, here, yeah, case. No, they, they, made a, they made it basically to be whatever you want. <laughs> they name the things with names that they actually are. <laughs> I didn't write anything of Boost, sadly, so, or maybe that's a good thing even. Um, Actually, I had this thought too a little bit. I found it weird to, to use an iterator there and uh, that you get a range or that it behaves like a range, let's, let's say like this. But um, I guess yeah, one gets used to it. <laughs> and it's, I mean, create a range would be an overhead you don't really need. Here you only need two free functions and otherwise you would need a range class or maybe use the, the iterator range class from Boost that would make another include. Maybe they, that's the reason why they opted against it. Course, you could have a uh, file system directory range, right? Yeah. And actually, I, for, for one of our libraries, um, I wrote iterators and uh, I, start, I uh, also wrote make range, make blah 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 range, make some range functions. Um, and la then later I found out about this and then I added that too. So I understand what you're saying. It, it feels more natural to have the make range. Maybe it's, I don't know, question of taste. Or you file a complaint <laughs> or a bug. <laughs> okay, it's, I guess more a discussion than really a question. Um, okay, now we know the, the, what the um, range-based for loop can do and uh, that it's really cool and we're really excited and want to use it everywhere. But soon we find out that there are some limitations. We can't do everything what we want with the range-based for loop. What if uh, you need to iterate in reverse order? That's not possible, right? It always uses the order of the container. Of course, you could use another ordering, for example, in a set or map, but maybe you need the order that the container has and you can't change it just because you want to iterate it reversely. Um, maybe you only want to rate, uh, iterate um, a subrange, a slice of the, of the original range. Um, maybe you want to iterate two or more um, ranges at the same time and do some, some crazy stuff. Or you want to iterate two um, ranges, one after the other. And there's a long list. Maybe you need an index for whatever, output, logging, whatever you want to do. Or you only want to visit every nth element. Or maybe you want to do something like std unique, but you know std unique would uh, change the, the container it works on, or the range, so to speak. And your range is const, you can't change it, so you can't use std unique but you need a unique range. Um, or, last example, um, you need a large uh, range of integers. The easy thing to do is uh, create a vector of maybe size 1 million and put all the integers there with std yota, I guess it is. But of course you need memory for the million uh, integers. That's not the most sensible thing to do. Um, I know for most of these problems you could have workarounds, so you can still use the range-based for loop and maybe keep track of the, uh, of the index manually, but it doesn't really feel so nice, especially in, in conjunction with the range-based for loop, which is really concise and clean. And again, the index could get out of sync, stuff like that. For the range-based for loop, stuff does not get out of sync. But um, there's boost range for us, as I said before. Boost range for the win, it will solve all these problems. Um, Next question about the, the level boost range. Any one of you familiar with it? Okay, like maybe five hands or less. Okay, that will be the long way then. Sorry for you guys. Um, boost range offers uh, range adapters. 
Range adapters are basically views. Those of you who know the range STS or range uh, V3 from by, by Eric Niebler, um, he calls them views. They um, provide a view on an existing range without changing the existing range. Um, and these views are usually lazy. So the, um, whatever they are, this adapting they're doing, they're doing it on demand. So if you give it um, one, uh, a range of size one million and you only iterate um, the, the first 10 elements, for example, or the rest is not evaluated, only the first 10 elements. So that is really nice because it only does the work you need to do. Um, yeah, to achieve this, um, for every range adapter, there's an adapting iterator, which iterates the original iterator, the adapted iterator. Um, it might change um, the type. For example, in the case that you want to iterate reversely, it might use internally an, a reverse iterator. Um, the, the, the increment operator might be changed. Instead of advancing one element, you might advance two elements to, to only visit every other element. Um, or maybe the, the, the reference operator is um, changed. Maybe, simple example, you don't want to get the original values, maybe you want to get the squares. Then the deref operator would square the original value and pass back the squared value. And maybe the, the adapter does several of these things. Um, and there's some helper functions for the cases that you have several ranges. The adapter syntax only can adapt one range at a time, not not several ranges, but we'll see this uh, with a nice example. Um, usage is always the same. And um, there's one header, boost range adapters, which contains all the adapters, but there's also for every range um, a specific adapter, a uh, specific header, sorry. Um, there's two forms of usage. One is the constructor form, where you, where you use boost adapters adapt, then you pass it the range, and then if there are any arguments expected, you pass the arguments. And there's a second form, which uh, reminds of uh, Unix piping. Um, it uses operator pipe. And uh, you write the, the original range, the pipe, and then your adapter. And if it has arguments, you, you add the argument after the adapter. Um, yeah, it's more detail, not that much important. Um, the pipe form is the preferred way, because it makes um, piping of adapters easier, easier to see. You get the first range. Then the, the first adapter, the second adapter, the third adapter, it's easier to understand it that way. If you use the constructor way, of course, then the order is reversed and it's a bit more complicated with all the um, braces and stuff like that. Um, yeah, now I want to show you some of them in action. Um, first one is uh, the reversed order. This is the example, and I guess even without knowing that adapter, if you read it, you would very soon understand what it does. You got um, a range here. We want to iterate it here. We use the pipe and then the reversed adapter. And guess what it does? It reverses the range. So the output, big surprise, looks like this. Yeah. Does this work on all the ranges? Or does this rely in some way on like our begin and our end, which some of the seven that we containers have, but obviously it's not what the ranges are for. <clears throat> okay, um, I'm not 100% sure, but I uh, repeat the question. Thank you very much. Um, so the question is if this works with all ranges or does it rely on R begin, R end? Um, actually, as I'm speaking, I'm realizing that uh, this range doesn't even have begin and end. There's free begin and end, but there's no R begin, R end. So um, the reverse adapter internally will use. Um, reverse iterator to convert the iterators it, re it retrieved via begin end into reverse iterators and then use that one. And then you increment, but in reality you increment the reverse iterator and yeah, you know. Yeah. So it only works if it knows the size or it has to cache uh, all the values. Yeah. So the question is uh, if, it only know, uh, if it only works if it knows the size or if it has to uh, cache all the values. Um, it ta of course, it uses the end iterator, converts it to the reverse iterator, which makes it R begin, and the same thing with the begin. So as I, as I just said, you got the begin and the end iterator. You convert both. So, okay, from your point of view, begin iterator points to the first element, end iterator points to the past the last element. 
Now you convert both of them to reverse iterators, basically doing this, more or less, not really, but more or less. And then use the former end iterator as new begin and the former begin iterator as new end and iterate. Single ah, single, uh, sorry, single linked list. Yeah, with a single linked list. So um, I didn't really mention this here. Thanks for the, okay, repeat the, not the question, but the, the problem here. The question was about the singly linked list. Of course, in this case, you can't iterate it um, in reverse order with or without the adapter, it will never work. And there's certain um, requirements for the adapters to work uh, on the iterator to, to be able to work with it. And um, so in this case, of course, it would, me it would uh, need to be a, um, a bi-directional iterator, which if it would not compile, yeah. I, maybe the conversion into the reverse iterator should fail. Ah, uh, it depends. It, uh, okay, the problem is that the singly linked list, the iterator is a um, um, forward iterator only, so you can't decrement it. That's basically the problem. Yeah. Interesting. Would be nice to, to test it, what, what really the error message would be. Well, the, the, the the, the, the forward list is sort of a bad example because it, it, it's sort of fundamentally different from everything else. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and and there's a more not so weird example might be the um, <laughs> stream iterators, right? Because Input the iterators. Stream, there you only really only ever have like one element available at the time. Right. As, as they're coming in. So there will be something where um, it, it just doesn't meet the concept and it wouldn't come. Exactly. So the comment was that the singly linked list is kind of a strange example because it's uh, very different from all the other containers. But um, stream input iterators might be another example where this fails. Um, input iterators le way less than the, the bidirectional iterators, so it also won't compile. Um, others might compile. For example, the visit every nth um, element should work perfectly fine. Yes. Range calling does it cause any specific um, criteria on the iterator that need to be used there? Uh, does it impose um, specific cr criteria on the? Like what? What are, what are the constraints that are imposed on the? On the on the on the on the on the original range? You mean? Yeah. What are the constraints on the original range? Yeah. So it, it depends on the on the range adapter. Depending on the, the features you want to use, um, the, the original range, of course, must support them. So as we just discussed, um, for the reverse iterator, there must be a way to iterate reversely, which is not possible with input iterators or the singly linked list. Um, in theory, you could think of some crazy iterator, which depends on a random access iterator. Of course, that is then a very strong um, requirement, and it will only work with a small set of, of ranges. Yeah. I think the question was about the range-based for loop. Ah, requires you, you, okay, so is the question about the range-based for loop? Oh, okay, but the range-based, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the range-based for loop is a bit interesting. Yes, it requires iterators. It depends on iterators. Without iterators, it can't work. But it has very, very low requirements on the iterators. You don't even need um, you don't need a forward iterator necessarily, but something less. Um, as I said before, it's only these three concepts are used: so uh, dereference, increment, and non-equality comparison. It's the only three things. And um, a forward iterator has some more requirements, like default constructible, copy constructible, stuff like that. That is not and not used. Okay, L losing more time than I thought. Um, <laughs> hopefully the next, um, ah yeah, the, the slides will be online later and then there's a lot of links in it. So if you're interested in the topic, um, if I didn't do any copy paste errors, then uh, you should get to the documentation of boost um, of the respective um, uh, range adapter. Next thing, sliced, uh, iterate over a sub range. Um, it looks like this. I mean, the syntax you, now you already know. Um, sliced. Um, the interesting thing is, as the iterators are in half open range, so are the so are the indices here. So this means um, start with element of index three, and do not reach element with index six. So in our case, 
we start with this element and stop before we reach this, right? So the output is 3, 4, 5, because we don't reach um, the element with index 6, which coincidentally is 6. Um, I would expect that the slice, um, slice the range adapter has um, overloads for different, um, or maybe it uses internally stit next, which then in turn has overloads for different categories of iterators to make use of uh, random access or um, whatever your iterator is. So to get the most efficient way of, of retrieving the, the correct iterators. Um, next thing is combine, also very interesting. It's the case that you want to combine several ranges into one range and uh, iterate them all at the same time. This is one of the cases where we can't have um, the adapter syntax, um, but it still is very understandable, I guess. We got um, three ranges of different type. We got integers, doubles, and strings. And we combine these three into one range. We iterate over it. And basically what it does, uh, you can already guess it, it uh, creates um, um, a range of... Um, um, tuple, thank you, of boost tuple, and then that's the reason why you need the boost get accessors to get um, the correct um, reference out of the boost tuple of references. Um, one important thing here, the three ranges need to have the exact same size. That's because of the equality operator. If you think about it, if you want to, you have several ranges and you want to compare two iterators, two iterators for, for equality, the, m the most natural thing is to expect all of the sub-iterators to be equal. But this means that you're only equal to the end iterator if all the sub-iterators are equal to the end iterator. Um, what this means is that if one of these ranges has, is longer, um, after reaching the end of this and this range, here we haven't reached the end iterator. So the comparison for end will return false, because it, not all three are the end iterator. And then you'll get a dereference um, of the shorter ranges, and your program, uh, program will have undefined behavior. So this is a really important um, thing here. Very, uh, very pitfall. I, I guess it's really hard uh, on boost side to do something against this. Yeah, still uh, the output that we would expect. Um, join is maybe not that uh, important. Um, it joins two ranges. Here, it, it, the first range from 0 to, to 2, the second range from 3 to 6. If you join them, oh, what a surprise, you get one range and the two concatenated. It can only concatenate or join two ranges, but of course you can do another join. So, yeah, you know the game. Um, index case. Very interesting. Uh, that's, by the way, the first iterator I came, I stumbled upon, um, and it's an it's an adapter which has an argument, and the argument by default is zero. It's the first index. So in this case, um, here um, you have a member function index to access the index and a member function value to access the value. The interesting thing here is that you ca you never ever can change the index or the reference um, which value returns, but the reference that value returns might be non-const. So you can um, change your um, original index, but uh, the original range, sorry, but you can't change the index. The index is, index is always guaranteed to be correct. That's what I before was referring to, that the index could get out of sync if you do it manually. With this solution, it's always the correct index. That's what I like so much about it. Yeah. Um, stride it is um, try to speed up a little bit. So we stride the range by three, so we get zero, then three more, three, three more, six, and nine. Easy. Unique, as I said before, there's still unique, but there's situations where you don't want or can change the the container or the range. In this case, uh, the unique um, range is very uh, useful. Um, the behavior is exactly the same. It will f this consecutive ones will be one one. This is not consecutive, so it will remain, and the consecutive threes will be reduced to one three. So your result is zero one two one three four. 
just the same as if you would have used std unique, but without changing the, the original um, container or range. And the last case, then uh, I'm done with the examples, um, is a large range of integers. Um, boost provides the function boost i range. Um, it looks like this here. Um, as before, you pass it the first index or the first integer with which, you, with which the range should start, and you pass it the first integer that should not be part of the range anymore. So this creates a range of integers from 0 to including 99 without allocating any memory, or at least dy yeah, dynamically allocating any memory. Um, this range can be used with std accumulate. Uh, std accumulate. There's a begin end, as you would expect from maybe a container. Uh, you pass 0, so that std accumulate starts um, summing up from 0, and you get the sum of all numbers from 1 to 99. Very nice. No, no allocations whatsoever. Question? Maybe not. There's one caveat, however. This is um, not as performant as a manual regular range would be. So if, the, if you need to do this in a performance critical section, don't do this. Use the old school ranges. But in code where performance is not that critical, you can use this to get a safer way of, of the regular range. Because again, you can't uh, modify the, the index or the integer that is returned inside the loop body. Um, um, I suppose it's due to um, the dereferencing, which does not really dereference, of course. Internally, the iterator simply stores the integer. If you increment, it increments the integer. Um, but I would guess that, I know inlining and stuff like that, but I would guess that that's the reason. It, there's not too much else. Same thing with ranges. We re in like compile it down to the same code as the normal. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Um, maybe it's wrong. Thing is that um, this sentence, note however, that in performance critical situations a less safe regular loop is preferable, is not mine but from the boost source code. <laughs> they might have some reason for writing it, um, but I don't. It's just the. Also, I've read on Stack Overflow some guy writing um, that um, he noted that it's less performant. So there seems to be something. Maybe we should put it in, in God Bold and see. Maybe next uh, lightning talk. Maybe they should write a version number of the compiler next to it, and <laughs> you should have a test, <coughs> test case to confirm it performs. Yeah, that's so true. For performance, you always have to have a test case. That's true. And uh, trusting some guy on Stack Overflow is usually not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> OK. That's it for the boost range um, thing. If you don't have any questions, I would continue with how to write your own range adapter. OK, no questions. So um, one time I, a time I came up with the problem that I wanted to iterate a range in, con in adjacent pairs. A um, usual, uh, usual example for this is, for example, if you need to calculate the length of, um, of a polygon, um, you sum up the, the length of the, of the legs, right? And to get the length of each leg, you calculate the, different, the distance between the begin and the end point, point of the polygon leg. And then if you think about it, your current end point will be the next start point. So that's more or less where my interest in, in this kind of iteration um, rise from. Um, so what we want to do is iterate a range like this in adjacent pairs, <coughs> right? And Boost doesn't offer something for this. I w once, a, once in time, I even wrote um, a feature request for this, but <laughs> until now, nobody, nobody fulfilled me my my dream. So um, I started to think about how we can do this ourselves, or how I can do it uh, myself. So the solution I came up with with works like this: we start with a source range, of course, because we want to adapt something. That source range is put into the, the operator pipe. And then there's a lot of operator pipes. So we t somehow we need to tell the operator type that we need, um, we need to get back the, the adjacent range. So the range with this adjacent pairs with it. So we use a tag class simply for overload, to, to select the correct overload to get the correct um, range. And with this tag class, operator pipe 
return the adapting range, which is adapting the original range. Adapting range has, well, a begin and an end iterator. These iterators are adapting iterators we need to write. And then there's something, I don't know of any better name, maybe if somebody of you knows, tell me. Um, I'd call it the adapter core, which lives inside the adapting iterator, which um, can do, um, let's say, type transformation. We'll come to it in a second. And um, because this is only some, some architectural stuff and you guys are interested in code, I'll show you code. We'll implement all these parts together. And so if I'm too fast, please, um, please stop me. Uh, I spent a lot of time writing this, so I, I know it very well now. Um, so we'll see. Um, the, the task of the adapter core is basically providing an easy means of access to the, to the, adapted, uh, to the adapting range. So if you remember the, uh, the index range, uh, the index adapter, um, the thing you had access to in the bool in the in the full body in the loop body, it had this index and value um, member operations, and they don't come out of thin air, of course. So it's the task of this adapter core to provide these uh, member functions. Um, and there's even a bit more to it. It's not really necessary for the range-based for loop, but maybe if you want to use your range with um, STL algorithms. Um, they, it might happen, they don't like so much that uh, when dereferencing that you return something by value. They more or less expect you to actually return um, a reference. So in order to be able to do this, um, this adapter core must live inside of the iterator so that we can return a reference or a pointer to it. Okay? So, adjacent pairs, so our um, adapting core, adapter core, let's call it adjacent pair. It must be templated because we don't know what range we are going to adapt. So we template it on the iterator that we are adapting. Um, we need uh, two iterators, one for the left or the forward, front facing, so to say, and one for the backward iterator, members. Um, we need a constructor to assign these two members. Then, of course, a default constructor never hurts. And um, although we it's kind of funny, we heard it in the talk before. Uh, what Uwe said, don't do it. I'm doing it here, so <laughs> maybe uh, it was not the best choice, but it works. So uh, I'm, I chose to make them protected and to later make the iterator um, inherit from a JSON pair privately because I don't want to duplicate the iterators. It would just bloat the, the whole thing and um, duplicate the values, not something we want. And now the interesting um, type, this is just a type def to make it um, easier to write and read. There's a f the function that we will use later in the loop body forward to receive a reference to the forward facing iterator and backward to receive a reference to the backward it um, facing iterator. Okay, easy, right? Okay, I don't see any, yeah, question. Forward and backward will be the, the left and the right side of the your addition. Correct. The, the, na the idea behind the naming is uh, like you got front and back in, in uh, maybe most containers or yeah, most. <laughs> um, I wanted to allude to that and that's why I called it forward and backward. Left, right, I guess is a good choice too. Um, yeah, now the adapting iterator. Next step. Um, we need, as I said, three things that we need to implement. One is the comparison for inequality. We don't even need comparison for equality. We need the prefix increment and we need the dereference. Um, and we should add uh, the default constructor, might be um, useful. And um, we should add the type defs for um, iterator traits. I don't really can't go into details here. If you're interested, um, go to CPP reference, look it up. Um, but there's um, STL code which uses these type defs to detect if something's an iterator or not, and we want our iterator to be detected as iterator, so we should add these type defs. Uh, copy constructor, copy assignment, we want that and we get it by default. 
And yeah, I already said that before in doing this, it's not really an iterator. It does not fulfill any of the iterator concepts, but it works with a range-based for loop. If you want to support specific algorithms with um, higher requirements, it is possible to enhance the iterator to fulfill all these requirements. Okay, the JSON iterator, as I told you, we're privately inheriting from the JSON pair. Um, these are the type defs. Basically, we're declaring our iterator as a forward iterator, although it's not 100% a forward iterator, but for this use case, that's um, sufficient. Um, the value type is uh, the JSON pair, adding const. Um, my solution is a read-only um, adapter, so you can't uh, change the, the original um, range. It would be a bit weird to change the right value in the, in the first iteration step and then in the next iteration step access them. I don't know, it, it kind of feels strange. Um, difference type is simply inherited from our adapted iterator and the pointer and reference type are the value type and added uh, pointer and L value reference. Um, default constructor and um, the constructor taking the forward and the backward iterator, they're simply forwarded to the adjacent pair where they are stored. Um, increment is quite easy, I guess. Nothing, nothing complicated here. We copy the backward, make right, left, and then increment right to be the new right, and that's it. The reference is easy. Um, if you choose to solve this not via inheritance, but composition, then of course, here you pass out the reference to the member. A um, bit interesting is the comparison for inequality, because you have two iterators, and you got basically the choices to compare both for inequality, or only the first one, or only the second one. I chose to use the right, the backward iterator, for a reason I'll come to in a few minutes. <coughs> um, yeah, now we got the, the adapting core, or the adapter core, the adapting iterator. We need the, oh, you don't have 10 minutes, that's mean. <laughs> uh, we need a range, of course, because it's still the range-based for loop. Um, the range only needs the begin and end member and some type defs. Boost has something uh, convenient for us, the iterator range. Um, you it's templated on the iterator type. And um, I'm doing a bit more. I'm defining using a type def adjacent range, which uses the iterator range with the adjacent iterator and the adapted iterator. And um, the tag class. Okay, nothing, nothing fancy going on here. We define a tag struct and a static um, tag uh, instance. Important thing is that this tag instance lives in the same namespace as the operator um, pipe for ADL, the argument dependent lookup to work. Yeah. And finally, the range factory operator pipe um, is the thing with that which puts all the other stuff together. Um, but there's still one, um, one thing missing, uh, mostly for convenience. Um, we put in a range and the tag class, and we give back the adjacent range templated on the iterator. But like this, this iter class, it can't be deduced, right? How would it be deduced? Written like this, when using the operator pipe, you would need to specify the resulting um, iterator type. That's not really something we want the client to do. So we need a solution for this. We write a small trait class. Um, a bit of magic, but not too advanced. Namespace detail. And um, we're pulling in std begin. Um, the free functions that begin, and then using Deckelval and Deckelspec, oh, we like these expressions, um, we use Deckelval to create an instance of range without really creating an instance, but actually it's an R value reference to a not existing instance. Then we can call begin on it. It will either be this begin, which we um, added here with using, or it will be um, the three begin in the same namespace thanks to ADL. This happens automatically. And then we use decal type to determine the type of the result of begin. And voila, there's our iterator type. And because we're lazy, we create this using to get rid of, um, of this type name and type stuff. Okay? Good, now finally we can write um, um, our operator pipe little helper function. Um, 
you pass, uh, you make a JSON range, you pass in the begin iterator, the next iterator, which is the first right or the face first backward iterator, and uh, the end iterator. And then it uh, creates um, the, the begin it the begin adjacent iterator, and this is the um, the end adjacent iterator. And now you see why I chose to use the backward iterator for comparison. If I would have used the frontward iterator, the forward iterator, sorry, we would have needed to um, decrement the end iterator once. Something we don't really need to do. We simply use the backward iterator, and we we put in both end iterators, and we're fine. It works. So finally, operator pipe. Um, we get begin and end iterator of the of the range, and now I notice that this did here is not really so nice. I guess I should do the same trick as before, using std begin and then let allow ADL to kick in. But okay, bear with me. <laughs> I hope you can you can um, you could um, yeah you know how to fix it. So first thing is if the range is empty. We can't return um, the the range we return should be empty too, right? So we um, simply pass three times end. So this will be end. This will be end. This is end anyway. Empty range. Everything good. We determine the next iterator, which is the first um, backward iterator. Uh, now we need to check for the case that the range contains only a single element. In this case, we can't construct the first pair. So also in this case, we need to return an empty range, same as before. And finally, at least two elements, we can construct the JSON range. So begin, next, and end. We get the JSON iterator with begin and next, and the end iterator. And that's all there is about. Um, all this, I put it into the namespace D, uh, DIY, do it yourself, because we had to do it ourselves. And um, yeah, apart from that, it pretty much looks like boost, right? We have um, uh, here, we have operator pipe, we have our um, range adapter, and we can access um, forward and backward. And the result is exactly what we want it to be. Um, the whole code, I tested it um, with. Uh, we told you we use the Microsoft compiler, so I tested it um, with um, the 12.0, with the 14.1 compiler, and also with GCC and uh, Clang and C++11 mode. So it should be pretty much C++11. And um, there's um, demos on um, Coley Roof for both compilers. They're linked here, so if you want to play around with it, feel free to do so. Um, and I also collected some further links. Um, documentation to boost range um, v2. Eric Nibbler's um, range v3. Um, the link goes to the manual. Really interesting. Just you don't need to read everything. Just have a look at it. It's really interesting. Um, he also made a talk at CppCon 2015, where he's implementing a um, console-based calendar without using if, um, so without branching, no for loop, no while loop. He is doing it all with um, with his ranges. Really, really crazy. <laughs> and um, lastly. Uh, Stephen T. LaVey, um, the guy from Microsoft who is maintaining their um, standard library, he answered on Stack Overflow a question which um, is actually the same problem, adjacent pairs. He did not do everything like I did, but there's some similarities, just to have um, a comparison. Yeah, so thanks for listening, and um, I'm open for some last questions, I guess. <clears throat> Yeah, question. Um, have you considered using boost iterator adapter? Um, for determining... Everything you mean uh, the iterator facade? Mm -hmm. Actually, I tried to. Yeah. Um, iterator facade, I tried to use iterator facade. Something did not work out. I don't quite remember what it was. And I had a bit, little bit of time pressure. Ah, sorry, repeat the question. So the question is if I considered using boost um, iterator facade. Um, so Considering the time pressure and the problem that I did not really understand, I decided not to do it. Plus, I would also have to introduce the boost iterator facade and how to use it, which costs time. So, But it's definitely a good idea to do it in production code. All the boost um, iterator adapters do it, or at least the ones I looked at.
<coughs> yes. Um, so the question is boost zip. Um, if I remember correctly, boost zip is to zip iterators. So it's basically the same as combine, but uh, you need to create the ranges yourself. Boost combine does that for you. So I guess under the hood, it uses it uses boost zip with the begin and end iterators. I'm not so. Multiple ranges. And if you look at the same range <coughs> but with an offset, you have an adjacent pairs. Ah, I know what you mean. Yes. Um, Actually, my first solution to this, huh, yeah, my first solution, ah, repeat for the camera. Um, so you could use um, boost zip to get a solution for the problem of the ch adjacent pairs by zipping um, the begin and end minus one plus begin plus one and end iterator. And then you get the same thing. True, but it's not as um, nice as this is because you then had to do boost get zero, boost get one. It's not so, the, the code is less, um, less clear, less obvious. With this solution, um, you get nice telling, um, nice speaking function names. In the indexed adapter, for example, there's a, a comment in the source code, yet another pair class. Yes, but it makes for good names, something like this. So they argue kind of that you could have used the pair, but then it's again first, second, like in std map, where maybe key value would have been nicer. So it's an issue of destructuring. Not having destructuring. Destructuring? It's an issue of not having destructuring? I don't get it, sorry. So don't take sugar where you unpack the pairs of tuples. Ah, ah okay, you could do this as well. Use um, maybe boost combine or boost zip under the hood and then unpack the, the, the yeah, that's right. More or less the same solution, yeah. <coughs> yeah. Yes, next question. So the question is that um, with C++ 17 and structured bindings, you could unpack, you could use these to unpack it um, in the in the range-based for loop. Correct. C++ 11 talk. <laughs> but yeah. They still will have crappy names, right? So just because we don't see the crappy names anymore, they're still there. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Next question. Your examples, you always have a trailing comma. Pardon? Could you repeat? In your in your examples, you always have a trailing comma. So ah, that's very likely uh, not. Ah, here. Ah. Of course, I know it's only to demonstrate the case, but we have a solution to get rid of the last comma because we don't really have the, <laughs> the end iterator ready to pass with the range based for loop. This is basically done. Ah, okay. So the question is: In my examples, there's always a trailing comma. Because, of course, we're iterating the whole range and we're not dis, um, differentiating between last element uh, or not last element. We can't really do that either in the range-based for loop. So there will be always the comma. Um, and if I have a solution, more or less I can think of a solution. I guess it would mean to um, carry around the iterator to the last, not to the past the last, but to the last element and then compare which sounds a bit expensive, but then on the other hand, it's you always need to branch when you want to avoid the trailing comma. So I guess you would need to... But then you can't really... With range adapters, you can't really do anything because you can't cut off the last element. You could, for example, slice the range to cut off the last element and then do separate output, which is not so nice. So maybe you would need something like um, customized copy and output iterator. What you can do... And I think this is the best solution, even though it's not nice. <laughs> is turn the, the trailing comma into a leading comma mm -hmm. and skip it on the first element. Mm -hmm. So and you will need a boolean for exactly. the first thing. You will need a boolean for, for the first thing. But yeah, I think that's the nicest you can do. You could wrap the boolean in the in the adapter, though. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I think it was a little bit ambitious to cover this topic in 30 minutes. So <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that's why the time management uh, ran a little bit out of bounds. So maybe one more oh, right. question and then we wrap it up. Okay, now that was intimidating, no, obviously. No. <laughs> so okay, so enjoy the. Thank mm. you.